So first of all, I'm very happy, very honored to be here today and with such a crowd uh, at 8.30. Um, on Friday, the competition is just really rare for me. <laughs> so thank you for coming here today. And um, empowerment has been a, a, a topic that I was uh, very interested in uh, when I was working in Macau, um, where I was a lecturer uh, at the Institute for Tourism Studies. And that every time I'm talking to those uh, service worker, where the um, American company coming into Macau, uh, trying to transform Macau to be a gaming city, and that they have a lot of difficulty to uh, work with um, the foreign company, where they do not understand where they're going to make decisions and where they uh, what to expect, and 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 that I, I started to think about uh, the concept of empowerment. And that was a very interesting. And then I moved here to Norway, and then I took on this study further. And uh, that was today I'm going to talk with you about uh, my research and so forth. Uh, here's the agenda. Uh, so I will first go through about what is empowerment, what is the benefit, and what are the challenges. Uh, there's never free lunch, right? So when you do something, there are benefits, but they're also, also coming with baggages that we have to deal. And uh, what can go wrong? Uh, why empowerment may fail in organizations? While it is like so profound, so sounds so significant, but still a lot of companies suffer from uh, uh, empowerment practices that they want to, but don't manage. And um, in my research, I developed an uh, empowerment gap model. And I will talk, go through with you what my findings are and uh, what are the implications. And that I come up with three keys to success. And uh, the last thing is something I work with Hydro. My research project was based on Hydro. And that throughout the process, we develop this idea of a leader subordinate contract. And I want to share that with you. Is that okay? Sounds good? Okay. So empowerment. Uh, empowerment is about a process where employee can gain mastery, meaning that they will become the expert of their task, of their field, of their job. So they are so it's a development process that employee through the process to get developed, to get the necessary skills and knowledge to become the expert. On the top of it, the sub uh, subordinate employees should have autonomy and control over their work. So the whole development process is that we have to nurture employees skills and knowledge so that they become the expert. They can do the job themselves without any supervision and that they will feel that they have a control of what they are doing. And think about this picture. A lot of companies consider themselves that the, the top man management may know the best and they give the framework to their subordinate. And actually, you're trying to constrain the individual potential. They can do a lot more if the constraint is taken away. And that's the concept of empowerment. So it's a mean that you can bring out the potential of the individual, that the individual can stretch and do the best of what they can because they are the expert. All right? And that you can fluid the organization structure, or you can change the job characteristic, the job design, and make the individual can do the best. Here is a hydro in the 1960s. And um, maybe some of you will know about uh, Professor Torslut. So he was a really profound researcher in Norway. Um, and he was working with hydro for this uh, research. And uh, the research is about how we can have the co-determinations between uh, employer and employees. And what's the outcome of that research? The Work Environment Act in Norway is very profound. A research that have the implications to the law, and uh, 
And I, I really love that connection. Um, so in Environment Act, I think it's a section 12, you have a list of um, uh, items that how we can enhance uh, employees' co-determination co uh, at the workplace. However, for this uh, allow based milieu level, they're focusing on organization structure and job characteristic, job design. But there's one thing missing here, which is the leader behavior. And that's what I'm focusing on on my research. How we leader can bring out the potential of the individual, how you can empower them, let them shine, let them light. So um, some study done uh, in 2001, so it's really quite a long time ago, is still it's saying that 70% of organizations try to do some kind of empowerment initiative. And think about now, the percentage is even greater. Huh? And um, Professor Jeffy Pfeffer, a professor at the um, University of Stanford, he used uh, Google as a showcase and saying that Google managed to bring out the individual potential using empowerment initiative and make them become their competitive advantage. Google. And Google is considered uh, one of the best uh, place you can work for, at least in the US. I don't know how about the world, but in the US, it's considered one of the best. However, still, some research saying that, ah, we're not sure about, maybe you can enhance the company reputation. However, there's still no really solid evidence on the benefits of empowerment. And uh, what the, actually the idea is, because empowerment connects in different levels. Remember, we talked about organization structure, we talk about job design, we talk about leader behavior, it's in different uh, levels. So it's a really complex uh, uh, concept. So what if they fail? Well, in the research, what we have found is that it's really little evidence on uh, the pos uh, uh, looking at, like most of them looking at the positive outcome, we really need to talk about negative outcome. So we, need, we know very little about it. And uh, the mainstream empowerment assumes that empowerment is a good thing that everyone desire. Everyone desire. Right? It's a linear relationship. More the better. Or if you put more, then everyone happy and then everything be good. However, do everyone actually want that responsibility? When you're given decision-making responsibility, it also means that they're coming with burden, right? You're accountable for that. And so when do we have or not have that desire, right? So that's the questions that I always have in my mind. And what could go wrong? Some research showing that resistance can exist. When you give a person decision-making responsibility, they will say, oh, I don't want that. You know? and, or they don't consider it is part of their job. They consider, like, um, if you are giving me, uh, uh, they, they consider that it is a leader's job to make decisions and that I am going to do what, whatever the leader uh, asked me to. And that, a lot of time, it requires a great deal of communications between leader and subordinate to decide on to what degree I'm going to decide on this and what, to what degree, what are you going to decide on that, right? And, and somehow, uh, decision-making responsibility is somehow like a taboo. We seldom talk about it, do we? We seldom go to our subordinate or go to our leader saying, how about we decide on our decision-making responsibility? We don't talk about it, right? However, how would you assume how much you're going to make decision, right? Is everything based on your assumption, right? Or how much you know about your leader or your subordinate? 
uh, which was done by um, Center for Creative Leadership. Uh, they have like, offices in different places in Asia, in Europe, in, in the US. And um, they have done a study across seven countries. Right? A wide range of industry, a big survey, two different positions in the organization. So they only ask one question. So what do you think is the most important competency for a successful leader? One simple question. And across all these uh, seven countries, wide range of industry, and these different positions in the organization, there are always two things on the top of the list. The first thing, leading your employee, your, um, your subordinate. The second thing is the strategic perspective, how you can make sense of the organization goals and mission and translate that and make action. Right? And for the first one, leading employees, what is that about? It's about how you are, can attract uh, good candidates and how you can develop them and make the best out of it. Right? And it's so important. And um, so then comes down to my uh, research questions when I did my uh, research. So how may decision-making responsibility be shared between leader and subordinate? How can we uh, know each other better uh, in, uh, in, in that issue? And also how we can have a better relationship? Right? And not just uh, having a good time socially, but on a working setting. How can we have a good working relationship? And then I come across uh, some literature on uh, Wosa theory. And um, Professor George Bernard Shaw, he was the founder of uh, London Business School of Economics. And he said, remember, our conduct is influenced not by our experience, but by our expectation. I thought that it was really a profound quote. Um, just uh, imagine you going to a restaurant, going to Andre Tasha, or going out to BI to the to your chaos. Do you have different expectations? Yes, we do. We do. And that expectation would influence how we will perceive the experience. If you go to Andre Tasha and getting a, a sausage, I'm sure you get very disappointed, right? And, and that is the logic. So our, how we interpret the event, how you see my lecture now, will be way much influenced by your expectation, how you see me when you first saw me and say, ah, oh, she's just 18. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing, huh? Um, so the expectations, uh, when the expectation is a lot bigger than the reality, then you will get disappointed. Then you will get disappointed. So I'm quite happy to look 18 because the expectation is a lot lower so that I can do a better job, an easier job for me. And um, in terms of trust, a lot of time, expectation is involved when we are building trust how much you can deliver what you have said. Think about your relationship with your children. Isn't it all the family uh, 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 consultancy will tell you, do what you have said to your children, do not break any promises, uh, trust. So here is my empowerment gap model. I looking into expectation and experience, perceived experience, uh, both from the leader and from the subordinate. So by these four boxes, host here is the leader empowerment expectation, and here is the subordinate empowerment expectation, and here is how the leader perceive their own behavior, and here is the subordinate, how they perceive leader behavior. And then I developed there are four potential gaps. So gap one, gap two, three, and four. 
So this uh, empowerment gap model is like a blueprint for us to pinpoint, okay, perhaps we have some issue, a gap one, maybe something we can do something about, either to change my own expectations or change the counterpart expectation to massage it, to do something about it. Right? So it's like a blueprint for us to map where we can do something. Right? So my research, um, Hydro was uh, really generous to participate in my research and then uh, I have done uh, a two-wave study, six months apart, and then I sent uh, the first time, I sent, uh, asked them for the expectations in terms of the leader behavior and from the leader I asked them what are their uh, expectations and the time to, I asked them how you perceive your behavior from the leader side and then I asked the subordinate how you perceive the leader behavior and then to see what, if I can map those uh, gaps and uh, I used uh, uh, web based and pencil and paper because they are first line worker at, um, at the plant. Uh, so here I'm going to show you some of the results and uh, I just had the presentation at Hydro last week and with the, the middle manager who has actually answered my survey and they were like, oh, all right. <laughs> so it was quite something for them at, at that moment. Um, so get one. So get one is here, um, here. So it's the gap between the leader expectations and subordinate expectations. And uh, it's about how much the leader aware of the subordinate and empower, uh, empowerment expectation, um, to put it that way. So the first thing, uh, when the gap is lower, meaning that the leader is more aware of subordinate empowerment expectations, so the gap is narrower, the subordinate find the job more motivating. They find the, the job gives them energies and to move forward. It's so important. Think about a zombie at work or an energetic person at work. What do you prefer? Um, and also, uh, when the gap is narrower, subordinate report that they have less role ambiguity at work. They find that the role are much more clear they know what they're doing and uh, a lot less of uh, uncertainty. Why would that be? Because they know to what degree they can make decision, right? And where is their, their song? And where is his song? Right? How he can or she relate to their leader. And they also have a higher self-reported job performance. Although it's not an objective measure, it's not measured by the leader. However, we know that from research, individuals that saying they are performing better, normally they are the ones that perform better because they believe in themselves. And that self-advocacy is so important. Um, I was once uh, uh, attending a seminar at the Stanford. There was uh, one professor he was uh, very much involved um, for helping those victims uh, from the 9-11. So he had been giving them uh, consultancy services and talking to them for years. And after years of research and observation, there was only one finding, only one, which is those that want to be happy, they become happy. And that's the thing, right? When you're believing in yourself, you do better. You manage that. And um, they tend to be a lot more innovative as well because they know their boundary. So they can move, you know? When you know your boundary, you try more. When you are feel uncertain, you normally stay put, you know? And they also have a higher evaluation of their leader. They think that the leaders are more effective because they are more clear on what their expectations and what your expectations they put up front. So that is gap one. Let's look at gap two, which is uh, the, ex uh, the gap between the expectation and experience. 
by the subordinate. All right. So it's like remember the example of going into restaurant with the expectation how you perceive the service. That's the thing. So how the expect uh, subordinate have certain expectation of the leader and how they experience six months later. So what's the logic of this gap? The logic is that when the experience do not match with the expectation, we tend to be disappointed or confused. So the result showing that the subordinate tend to be less happy at work. So they, uh, they find the job less satisfying. There's not enough, something wrong, right? And that they felt that they, have a, they don't have a sense of control at work. They are confused. They don't know what they should expect. And that they find their work role overwhelming. That they cannot cope with the demand. And also, they become less committed to the organization. We know that from research that leader represent the organization in front of the subordinate. Meaning that when the subordinate doing with the leader, they project that to the organization. Right? Mm -hmm. So for the leader is a tremendous responsibility because you're bearing the whole organization behind you. And that's what happened here. When the subordinate do not have the right interactions with the leader, they just project that to the organization that the that organization is not fitting for me. Right? And also, they have a less favorable, perceived less favorable with, uh, relationship with the leader. They thought that the relationship is not working. So for gap three, uh, gap three and gap four, uh, in terms of my research, I haven't have any empirical evidence. I do not have sufficient data to conclude anything because I have only like 60, 70 leaders. Um, so that would be my wish that I can push it further and to see how I can develop um, in that area. However, I'm looking back to the research that I consider what could be the possible outcome, okay? So gap three is about how the leader expect of himself or how, could, how he expect the situation and how he perceive their own behavior, right? So it's a lot of like uh, self-judgment here. I would expect that a leader, if they have a bigger gap tree, they will have a reduced leader self-esteem. From psychologists, we know that we tend to judge ourselves for our behavior, right? And when our behavior is not meeting our own expectation, we tend to be pretty tough to ourselves. You, know? you, you felt that I'm not good enough, I, I should do better, and, and so forth. And that they, they may start thinking that, okay, maybe this is not, it's not for me. Um, I'm not fit to that position because I'm not delivering what I'm expect of. And that they may have less job motivation because they don't get the energy from the achievement, right? They're trying to harm themselves. Okay, maybe I'm not good enough. I would add one more here. Mm. It would be leaders' disappointment with subordinates. That could be too. Yeah, yeah so I've been in situations mm. when leader was shocked I thought my employees were much wiser than that. So it's like transferring the guilt you know, right. uh, to, to the employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I have that a lot. Normally, when I talk to a leader, oh, the empowerment is not working, you know, they don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Right. So that could be one of the, uh, the outcomes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gap four. Gap four is the gap between leader perceived behavior of themselves and subordinate perceived leader behavior. So if the gap is smaller, what does that mean? It means that the leader will have a, 
um, uh, a better self-awareness of their behavior. They have a better self-judgment of how much empowering behavior that I'm actually giving, right? So if the leader rating is much higher than the subordinate, what does that mean? He's bragging, but actually he's not giving. Right? And, and vice versa, if the subo uh, leader rating is much higher than subordinate rating, what does that mean? So some individuals tend to under-evaluate their own performance. And from research, we know that Norwegian leaders tend to have that tendency. They tend to under-evaluate what they are doing. And is that good? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, we are showing that under-evaluate leader is a better leader than over-evaluate leader. And that research is shown that. However, when you under-evaluate yourself, you will always constantly in a situation where you consider you are not doing good enough. And that, that is stressful. You're putting a lot on your shoulder. And that you are not bringing out your optimal uh, potential. And for me, I would consider the best would be, and which is so as well, leader that know what they're doing and confident about what they're doing. And that is the best condition that a, a leader um, could dream for. Right? So some of the potential outcome that I consider, it could be that the, when the leader is less self-aware, they will have less ability to modify their behavior. Either over-evaluate or under-evaluate, you will have less ability because it be, you are not clear about the situation. You are less clear than the individual where they, 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 they self-aware about their behavior. Right? Normally, we always talk about first you get the awareness, then you can do something. When you don't have the awareness, you stay put. Right? And also, you have less ability to develop a good relationship with the subordinate. Right? It is pretty clear as well that when you are in the haze, right, that you over-evaluate yourself or you under-evaluate yourself, you don't know exactly what the other part was perceiving yourself, you will have a lot more distance than those that are more self-aware. And that we should show that uh, leaders that are over-evaluate themselves or under-evaluate themselves, they tend to be less effective. So trying to put this all together uh, again, um, so this empowerment gap model is a, a blueprint for us to pinpoint where are the gaps and what we can do. Huh? And that subordinate expectation should be understood. I think um, supporting the expectation has been understudied. We always think about uh, what they perceive about their work. We never really talk about what their expectation of work, what are their motivation. And uh, when you know about the expectation, then you can start doing something. You can influence them in order to put them to a more uh, closer to you or closer to the team. And uh, there are, I consider there are um, three critical drivers that perhaps you can do something about. Of course, there are many more. There are, I, I think of the three critical ones. The first one is that you have to create an open reciprocal communication. Just open is not enough, it has to be reciprocal. When I say reciprocal, meaning that you have to ask them the expectation, you also have to tell them your own expectation. Right? And the second is that subordinate have to feel safe to voice out their opinion. If there would be any hints of negative consequences, 
what do we do? Of course, we don't say anything, right? And the third, um, my wish is showing that the greater you have interdependency with your subordinate, the more the chance <coughs> they were trying to tell you what they think. So I'm going through these uh, three um, driver uh, more in detail and so that we can uh, discuss about it. I would really welcome for comments and interactions. Uh, I really love them. Uh, so the first thing and the first step, the most important thing, you have to create the right climate, meaning that you have to really um, tell the subordinate what are the goals of the organization and how that can translate to the meaning of their work. It's only that they can make sense of it. They will feel that they are in a position where they will try to do the best for the organization. From research, we, we know that we uh, normal individual, I'm not talking about sick people, eh? normal individual, we want to be good. Who don't want to be good, right? Of course, you want to be recognized, you want to be good. And you have to show them the path, how they can be good. And in Western training, um, we sometimes we assume, well, if they have a problem, they will come to talk to me, right? No, it doesn't happen that way. Some people are more shy. Some people don't have the, the necessary skills to communicate uh, that their desire, their expectations. And then you have to give them some tools, some, uh, some training on how they can do that in a constructive way, right? In a constructive way. Lead by example. Well, with the old saying, easier said than done, you know? We can always say, ah, we are going to have an open communication. And if you don't do anything about it, and you're not going to anywhere, you know? and you have to uh, act on it, take action, right? And uh, put them and, and tell them, if we want to have an open, reciprocal communication, what are we going to do? Put them down onto action level, operational level. And only that, the individual will start doing something. And the last one, plan and social event. Well, I'm not going to ask you to go for a party every night. Uh, at Google, uh, when they uh, do the layout of their, what they call the Google campus, they have set a lot of like a social area for employees to mingle. Just take an example of the canteen. The architect or the management actually said that they deliberately to, to make people to stand in queue. They don't need to stand in queue if they have do a better layout or do another layout. But they make them to stand in queue because when people stand in queue, they start talking. And they found that there's a wonderful way for individuals to, to, to start interact with other people, to come up with innovative ideas, and to talk about work situations and, and share feelings and perceptions. So the second driver was we talk about uh, how we can create a climate that subordinate can feel safe to voice out their, their suggestions. Remember that. Every time a subordinate trying to talk to the leader, they're taking a risk. They are taking a risk. Uh, and, and no matter it is actually a risk or a perceived risk, they have to overcome that and go to the leader. And normally, it, it's when the situation is really bad, I really have to talk to the leader and then they go. Right? And, and you don't want the situation to become really bad before they come to, come to you. Right? So you have to make them feel safe. Uh, to talk. And what we can do? The first thing, you have to share the accountability. When I read through the empowerment literature, the only one worst thing could happen for empowerment is that you give them the authority, but don't share the accountability. Meaning that whenever what thing happens, it's on you. Right? And that is not empowerment. That is less of fear. 
So you dedicate everything else and then you do nothing. Right? That's lots of fair leader. And that is a big distinction. Empowerment leader is not that I dedicate and then I can you know, be free. You are going to be there with them right? and share with them. And I find this call is really uh, inspiring. When you blame others, you actually lose the power to change. When you want to change, you have to be there with them for the good or for the bad. And be available. And look at that, this cartoon. Mr. Wheeler's door is always open. Just don't try to go in. Yeah. So if you not actually be available, be approachable, they won't come to you, even though you have the door open. You really have to manage it. And uh, uh, just going back to that uh, uh, being available thing, uh, like for example, for, for us teachers, we always set a, a regular visiting hours. It could be something you can think of, that you make a regular pattern that your subordinate knows that exactly on Tuesday, uh, 10 to 12, you are always there in the office, available for them. A lot of time, uh, leaders, they tend to be a really busy schedule uh, all over the place. Uh, they become a, a lot less visible to the subordinate. And then if you constrain yourself, I'm going to be the office at this exactly the time, and that you are making that time for your subordinate is a lot more welcoming. And be explicit for inviting um, feedback and input. And only that you show appreciations and more feedback will come. And that is shown in the research and it's very profound. And be open and also show that you can also make mistakes. Look at the Superman, he's so lonely. You don't want to be there. I would rather to be a normal human. We work together. The point is that your subordinates are working with you and not working for you, right? So the third, third driver, building a tight leader subordinate task interdependency. How could we do that? The first thing, you have to tell them what are their goals. And what are your goals? And how are they interconnect? Right? In which way your goals and their goals are interconnect? And what are the things to do in order to achieve that? What are your things to do and what are their things to do? And not only telling them it is your goal and that's your to-do list. And you have to also show them what your goals are in order to achieve the, the common uh, goals for everyone in the organization, and what are your to-do list? And um, to have a reciprocal report on work progress. I think a lot of times we have like those team meetings, right? And the team meetings, what does that mean? The team talk about their progress, and then they the leader listen, say, oh, good job, good. But uh, you never tell about what you have done. Right? And I think it's just fair to have a reciprocal report. What you have you done in order to make things smooth? Um, not just to be fair, but also that a lot of times subordinate, was, when they are far distant from the leader, they would just consider, ah, oh, they're just doing some paperwork, yeah. some business dinner. Yeah. Some good stuff. Yeah. And, and, and if you can show them what you have done, what, what were your effort you know, in that process, they will appreciate it. And regular, frequent interactions. Only that when we have a lot of interactions, we can share a lot of information. And you will be really surprised how much information you can get from your employees. They always know everything in the company. So here I'm talking about 
uh, a leader supporting a contract. So you can see that through my presentation that leading to this, uh, this path. Uh, in Hydro, they have one called team contract. It's a team contract, the team member working together and make a contract for everyone in the, and the, in the, in the team. I found it very interesting. And what's different here is that you make a reciprocal contract between the leader and subordinate. And uh, when I talk about reciprocal, meaning that it's a mutual understanding on each other's role and things to do in organization, right? So there are things that uh, I consider could be interesting in order to, uh, to make this work for the leader supporting a contract. So we talk about uh, we, ha we have to have a shared aims, right? If we, if you two go different path, <laughs> it's really to about the contract. Huh? And uh, you have to agree upon the contract, right? It's not a forceful process. It's a co-determined process. And that you have to be realistic, not to push too much. And uh, more importantly, you have to revise and uh, review that contract regularly and so that to work on it. It's not like uh, every year we go back to that contract to see if we can improve, right? Uh, do it more frequently just to have like some feedback on how is that going, how are you doing, and how am I doing, and weigh up our position. Like in two, three months time, just have, have a casual talk. It don't need to be anything formal. Right? Yeah, except I would like to ask a question. Was it an oral contract or kind of gentleman agreement between leader and uh, employee? Depending on how you want to do it. Actually, uh, I've been talking a lot of my idea to my husband. And uh, he's leading a team as well. And then one night, he came back home and then told me, Sidi, I got a contract. I said, what contract? And I said, well, you talk about this leader subordinate contract. And he did one. And, and then he was so proud. And uh, what he did is that he was sitting with his team. And uh, they talk a lot about how the team as a whole uh, wants to have a common goal. And they talk to each of the team member and how they see themselves, because each of the individual have kind of unique position. They're doing different tasks, but then interconnected. And then they talk to each of the individual, how uh, she or he see himself to achieve their common goals. And, uh, and that how he as a leader can help him or her uh, or do in that process. And, uh, and I think they, they did do uh, the written contract and uh, it was just last month, so that he hasn't been back to that contract again to ask them the feedback on how's that going. But he was really done about the effect of that contract or that kind of ceremony. Uh, they found the employees a lot more engaged and uh, during the process, uh, his uh, team member even initiating that he didn't think of, right? The creativity just blossomed in that process. And, and a lot of times the employees know better about the, 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 the work process. They know a lot of single details and how it can make things smooth and stuff. And, and, and he found it really amazing. And they, the, his a team member was uh, really amazed about how he bring up his uh, expectations and how he was open about um, how his expectations should be changed according to their um, uh, opinion. So it was a, a, a women situation, I would consider, and uh, it was a very interesting thing for him to observe, and I was so proud. Was like, oh, good. <laughs> so please, uh, if you're interested and find it uh, suited for your organization, try it and send me an email. Tell me. Uh, 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 what has happened, how's it going, and, and update me. I would really, really love to hear those stories. Right? And uh, there's one thing, the most important thing, is that do not raise false expectation. Every expectation that you raise, do it. Right? Do your promise. Do, walk the talk. Right? That's what we always say, walk the talk. Do not do 
Do not praise something that you cannot manage. Right. So to sum up, uh, for my whole approach is that it is a dual perspective. We're not only looking into the leader perspective or the subordinate perspective, but trying to have their uh, mutuality between them. Right? Take them both into consideration. And that if it's wider the discrepancy, the distance between the leader and subordinate, it seems that um, the worse it becomes in terms of their working attitudes or work behavior. And, uh, and that's something we might consider. Uh, when I was presenting to Hydro last week, uh, there was one question come out that uh, they were asking, so how is that different than the, what do you call, uh, the, um, the performance appraisal? Um, what do you call in Norwegian? Uh, yes. Yeah. And what do you think? I consider the me by some tala, most of the organization, when they do it, it's more like a one-way communication. It's not really a, a two-way. So most of the, the time is that the organization asks them, they say, what do you think about your work? Do you happy? And that's the first stop there. <laughs> There's not really much going on beyond that line. Uh, but for me, consider the leader supporting a contract is a process that that you evolve all the time. It's not a full stop there, but the contracts only help you to the next step and then next step and again and again and again. And that is a reciprocal communication. Uh, so it's quite different than your may Allah by some tala. And that may Allah by some tala, I consider it's only you can get feedback from the subordinate and that's it. Um, so that's what I have for today. And uh, you can send me email anytime if you have any questions, or you can go to my uh, uh, website and to see my um, uh, study that I have published. Um, <coughs> it will be interested. Um, do you have any questions? You will send it, or someone will send the presentation, yeah? Yeah, sure. Uh, we can do that. Uh, <laughs> actually ask if, because uh, when, when I saw the title of the presentation, Empowerment, okay, I decided to come, but I just thought that it will be another kind of buzzwording around mm. empowerment. So I believe that uh, the challenge is that uh, we are using often notions mm. actually not reflecting at all. So many leaders think that to empower is just to let someone to make a decision or do things without really re reflections. And subordinates as well, they do not aware, they wish they were empowered without actually knowing what it means. So do you have the feeling that many leaders actually they <coughs> don't know what empowerment mm -hmm. is? Just like some of us don't know what really process is, you know, but you feel forced to understand all those words and notions without reflecting? It is a very good question. And that is the questions I always have when I was reading uh, the empowerment literature. And it is known as well. Empowerment is a really uh, a first word. Has a lot of different associations and different looking into empowerment in different ways. And uh, certainly, uh, when I, especially when I was talking to Norwegian, I was asking them, so how would you translate empowerment in Norwegian? No one could answer me. There's no such word. There's no such word. And uh, from a um, social construction perspective, language is a big part of it when we try to construct a concept, right? And when that language, that words does not exist. And um, it, it becomes way even harder for a Norwegian leader to understand what empowerment is about. A lot of times they will talk about co-determination. 
and it is the closest that I consider it is um, in, to the respect of empowerment. However, it's different. Co-determination is about collective bargaining. How um, employee and employer together bargain for a better working environment. That is co-determination. And that empowerment is about a process where the leader, Kaska K, uh, give power to the subordinate and subordinate take charge of it. Right? And of course, the co-determination part is a part of it, but it's not all. Right? And, um, and yes, in terms of empowerment, the biggest challenge is the implementation because the concept is so vague and it's a lot of different meanings and that some people may uh, misuse empowerment, like your example, and some organization will equal empowerment as productivity. Right? And that isn't, it shouldn't be the purpose. Right? It, it, it should be the benefit of it, but it shouldn't be the purpose. Right? The purpose is that individuals should have a sense of control at work and they feel great about what they're doing. Right? And that the benefit would be they become more productive and everyone happy. Right? Uh, but yes, a lot of organizations tend to misuse that and they don't manage. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes? yes I was just wondering about how you see this towards uh, self-employed practices. Um, in terms of that, I... And expectations. Right. Uh, it is a, a, a good point uh, in terms of like, I expect that and I act upon that, right? Uh, I, in my research, actually, it does show that subordinate have a higher expectations. They tend to engage in uh, decision-making responsibility much greater than those that have a low expectation. Even though they were not given the necessary responsibility, but they take charge, right? However, I consider that is a great thing. When an individual that are willing and commit to take charge of their work, what does that mean? There's some energy in their body, you know? And that, uh, that the person care about their job. If I don't care about my job, I do not even do anything, you know? Just do whatever I can in order to, to make my paycheck. But if you are committed to it and craft your job, meaning that you are committed and you want to be better, and you want those individuals, and you want to cultivate that. Right. So, however, those individuals have high expectation. However, not given the the necessary uh, uh, responsibility, they, they they tend to be a lot more demotivated. They tend to be a lot more um, uh, dissatisfied at work, but still trying to do whatever they can in order to craft the job. And it is a, it's a really pity because uh, those individuals are those that you really want to keep, right? They have high expectations of empowerment. They want to do better. And those are really uh, are the contributor to the organization. Thank you. Any other questions? Then I hope that you enjoy the talk today. And uh, do send me email if you have any questions, okay? Thank you.